Hi, everyone. Welcome back to session four. We only have one left after this, and we're pretty much covered our whole year. This is a big one, though. We have lots to cover here today. So um, be ready to kind of grab some links in the chat box as well. Uh, and then you'll have a chance to certainly, when you're watching the video again, to pause it and to grab some of the things as you go through. My name is Chris Sarsky. I am one of the consultants with the ARPDC. I work through CARC, uh, and my pleasure today to look at session four with you for grade four, the new grade four map. So to begin our session, before I do the acknowledgement, just to quickly remind everyone, or if this is your first time, generally within the acknowledgement, we put some type of a link, whether it's a video, it could be, um, a reference, it could be a book that we're giving uh, some thought to that relates to what it is that we're about to cover uh, from the Indigenous lens as well. So this today's what you have is a link that talks about the Indigenous ways of knowing in regards to mathematics. So when you click that on, I'm sure you'll find some information there that might be helpful to you in a variety of different um, organizing ideas. So let's begin in the spirit of our reconciliation. We want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. Hey, Betty, nice to see you. So our agenda today is one of going back a little bit over February, because when we met before, we only did half of that month. We just touched on it. So I'm going to go back through, but it's all tied together today. Um, you've got your equivalent fractions, your decimals, fractions, and percents. They all tie into the discussions that we've already had on unit fractions. So I will go back over it for somebody who hasn't seen that but I'm not gonna unpack it to the depth that we did in sessions two and three. So if you need to go back, then please feel free to go back and have a look at those videos as well. So we're gonna tie all of those pieces together into sort of one big um, uh, concept of unpacking and learning, but also in a way that we can tie them together for the students as well, right? We wanna make sure that they understand the connections between this. It shouldn't be just a, I'm teaching you this today, I'm teaching you this tomorrow, this tomorrow, but they don't really get the connections between them. We're going to just touch a little bit about adding and subtracting because you're working and finishing. That's an ongoing number, that's an uh, outcome that's been going on since the beginning of the year in small chunks and in small increments. And now as we slide into the end of the year, we're looking at sort of really consolidating our ability to add, including decimals to the 10,000s that we have as well. So those are the pieces that we're going to look at and make sure that we have all of those, um, all of those components in there as well. We're also going to look a little bit about um, algorithms because that seems to be coming up over and over and over again. Uh, and what does that mean? And so we'll just touch on that as well. And I'm provided you with lots of slide decks within this slide deck. So. I'll encourage you when you're watching this video to again, pause it, have a look at what you need out of each of those decks. You're not gonna need them all and see what kind of fits into the unit the way you have it planned. And then we're gonna talk about time because time is something that we're working on here as well. And we just wanna get those components put together. I'm going to defer the algebra until our next session simply because there's a lot that we have going on today. And for most people, as you've been checking in, you're not quite ready for it now, so we will leave that for our next session. So when we look at February, we did unpack a lot of February. We talked about those equivalent fractions, but we just talked, touched on them. So again, I'm going to, again, I'm going to go back over equivalent fractions from the perspective of a unit fraction, but I'm tying it into fractions, percents, and decimals at the same time. So students, should be really versed in finding unit fractions. Now that should be, um, they're comfortable with that. You should have been working with that quite a bit already. Um, and now we just wanna leverage their understanding there, use it a bit as a review, but also to leverage their understanding on how do I move to equivalent fractions. And then when I ask them to reduce a fraction, 
Am I going to a unit fraction? Am I going to the lowest form? Is the lowest form a unit fraction? Uh, four and five, or four and four, and four and two are those two that are ca carried on right from the beginning of the year. So we'll talk about those. But I did embed another slide deck in there for you. I won't have time to go through the entire slide deck, but I will touch on it with you. And then four and six is that piece of fraction decimals and percent. So that's why I say today we're we're encompassing all of these outcomes. It's that spiral approach as opposed to oh, I'm going to be teaching five and or 4 and 5.1 and 5.2 this week. Uh, I'm doing six next week. Kids shouldn't see them like that. They should see them as all encompassed and put together. We'll also look a little bit at some of the pieces that we uh, talk about as we look at time. So I'll unpack those for you as well. So this is just, I won't read this through, but it's something that I have shared at conventions already. Um, just sort of a quick snapshot and guide of where do all these unit fractions, we keep talking about unit fractions, and it's not something that we're throwing in just because it is something that shows up over and over and over again. So even though it might not be explicitly stated, the fact is it's a foundation for even the grades that it doesn't have the word unit fraction in it. So we really do want to make sure that we can um, connect those pieces for the students. So again, I'm going to remind us that when we talk about fractions, because that's going to be a lot of what we work today, fractions, the decimals, percentages, we want to just sort of hold back on just delivering information to the students rather than, you know, rather than saying to them a fraction is a number over a number, the top number is the numerator, the bottom number is the denominator, the bottom number tells me how many parts I have, the top number tells me how many of the whole parts that I have. Oh, that's all true. But if I'm not a math student, or I really am not understanding that fractions are a relationship between two numbers, that's just all info. And somewhere I'm either going to choose to memorize what you're saying, or I'm just going to walk away from it and say, I don't know what that means. I don't care. So if we can just hold off on using the fraction is language or just throwing the one over something or two over something on the board and just identifying it for them. Let them unpack it again. So if you're just starting fractions, give them time to understand that fractions are just a relationship between two numbers. And the reason I want to bring that back up again, and we did talk about this uh, in our second session, is when we ask students, a lot of our junior high students, when you ask them, what is a fraction? They won't identify a fraction as a number. They just say it's a fraction. It's okay, what does that mean though? It's just a fraction. So they don't have an explanation for what a fraction is because they've been told it's this, it's a number over a number, but they're not actually considering it in the number system. They would struggle to put that on a number line. Most students do have trouble, difficult times with numbers on a number line, um, leave alone putting fractions and decimals on a number line. Again, if we introduce unit fractions to them and they learn how to count by the unit fraction on the number line, I have a better chance of saying to a student, could you put one fifth and one sixth on a number line for me and tell me which one do you think is smaller? That They have a good understanding of where those are going to go. I don't care that they don't perfectly divide the line up, but they would know that one sixth is going to be smaller and it's going to come closer to zero than one fifth is if I've been doing that work already. So we want them to count with unit fractions the same way that we taught them to count as one, two, three, four, five on a number line. So we want students to be able to see a unit fraction, not just be shown it on the board. We want them to see it and be able to find it on their own. So this is familiar to us. I will not go back over this whole unpacking. This is that part for if you're new to this session. Um, we have done this before, so you might want to watch such sessions two and three. But again, just as a quick reminder, I could take any number line and give it context. Context is so important for kids, especially kids who are struggling in math. It's important for any child. It's important for any adult to have a context. But if I don't get math at all, like if it's not my strong suit, then having a context to connect it to will make it so much easier for me to learn what it is you want me to learn. So in this case, we just took a simple number line and put cent signs behind it. So really, what are we doing? We're taking 100 cents. We're building a loony. That's just a simple 100 point number line. And that's an easy fix to do is just put cent signs behind it. 
So I could increment each of those 10 cents by putting a dime underneath. And in actual fact, putting that dime underneath as we unpacked it before, we know we need 10 dimes to make a dollar. So this first dime is first dime out of the whole possible 10. So that could be written as a unit fraction. I could use Cuisinaire rods to do the same thing. So when you get the slide deck here, and rather than putting it in the chat box, when you get the slide deck, these are already hyperlinked for you. So if you don't have Cuisinaire rods in the school, most schools have them. They're just the best kept secret because nobody knows what, what they are. And so they've been hidden around and nobody knows what to do with them. So here's a link if you need a virtual one, but look in your school to see if you have them. The really original ones were just a light pine colored wood. They were all the same color, just different sizes. Pattern blocks is another one that I can use to, to make unit fractions for students. So again, if I haven't done the work, if I just mentioned unit fractions, but I haven't done the work with them, back up a few steps because it'll save you time in the end. Do the work with them in a variety of different forms. Money's one. Cuisinaire rods would be another. The pattern blocks would be another. Here's some links down here for you to use if you, if you don't have enough of those and you want some of them to do it on virtual. Or if you've got kids who are sick at home, then they've got an opportunity to still do the work. They don't, they don't have to be in front of you and have a pattern block in front of you. They can still do it online. So in this case, we picked out the, the orange rod. And so if you're watching this video again, I would say pause it, go get some Cuisinaire rods or bring them up on your screen and bring out an orange rod, a dark green, a light green and a black. And what I'd like you to do is to build rows on top of each one of these, just that are the same color. So I can build as many rows as fits on here with whatever Cuisinaire rods you have, but I'm not allowed to mix the colors up on any given row. So if you've got that kind of understood at this point, same thing with the, with the pattern blocks, I want to cover them, but I only wanna cover them with one color. I don't wanna mix and match colors. How many different rows could you make if you're covering them with just one color? How many rows can we make on here? How many rows can you make on each of these? So you might wanna pause the video now, go ahead and do that uh, and then come back. So this is what it will look like once I have covered the rows as much as I can. Now we've done this work before as well. So that's why I don't wanna spend a ton of time on this, but it's important for where we need to go when we're talking about fractions, decimals, and percents. So here I see that this dark green had the light green, had red row, and had a white row. Remember that the white row has white units on top. They're individual small units. It doesn't matter what the unit is. In this case, I will learn that the unit is one centimeter square. But for starters, if you've never done anything with the kids before, it doesn't matter. How many units do you have on top? There's six of them. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me that the green is six units long. Six of whatever these whites are, in this case centimeters, it's six units long. It also tells me that a red is two units long because I can see that two whites fit on a red. I can see that a green, the light green, is three units long. So I've learned right off the bat, without knowing anything about Cuisinaire rods, that the green is six. I've learned that the light green is three, the red is two and the white is one. So now I can translate that even further into the orange one. I could fit yellows on there, I could fit reds on there, and I can fit whites on there. So I find out I get 10 whites to make an orange. And I know what an orange is. That means if there's two yellows, each one of those will be five because five and five is 10. We already know the red is two, so two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. So we need five of those. Over on this side, I found out that when I was trying to fill these, there were just was nothing. Like I couldn't get reds to fit. I couldn't get yellows or light green. Nothing except the whites fit on top of the light green and the red. And so when I count these up, I get three, six, seven. I find out that the black is seven long. I found out, as we already learned, that the green is three long. So where do I go with some of this? Well, you had other outcomes that you did already when you did prime and composite numbers. And we covered those in another session, but this is just a quick review. I've just shown the difference between a prime number and a composite number. What was the definition? 
a prime number was any number divisible by one. Well, there they are, one. They're all just ones on top. That's all I could find, and itself. I couldn't find another row other than the ones. This is a prime number because it's itself and one. These are not prime numbers because I've got the number, the ones, and some things in between. The fact that they both had four la layers on them or three layers on top. That's just coincidental. They're not always going to be that. Some might have more, some might have less, but they definitely have more than just the white. So this is what a prime number looks like. And that's so important for our students to see. This is what a composite number looks like. So a composite number is a number that's divisible by more than one and itself. Well, here's the more. I see two other colors. What I've also seen is if this is six and this is 10, what is the common factor? Remember, numbers that make up a number are its factors. What's the common factor between 10 and 6? The common factor is the common color. The color red is worth 2. 2 is a common factor for 6 and 10, which it is. What I've also created was the math facts for 10. I see I have 1 times 10 here. Here I have two times five. Here I have one, two, three, four, five groups of two, or five times two. And here I have 10 times one. So now students actually, if you've got kids who have never learned their math facts or multiplication tables, and it's not because they haven't tried, maybe just sending it home to memorize is not working for them because they are the kind of brain that needs to see what the heck you want me to learn. I don't understand what it is I'm learning. So even memorization doesn't come to them because they're not connecting it to something. Now I can see what two times five, five times two, 10 times one, one times 10 looks like. And sometimes that's all kids need is just to see it. So the same thing is true over here. Now, this also allows me now to get into the conversation about unit fractions. Because if I take away everything except one of each of those color on the orange, the yellow reflected one of two. So this is a unit fraction of one half for the orange. Here is a unit fraction of, there were five of them here, one fifth for the orange. Here is a unit fraction of one tenth for the orange. So each rod could have multiple unit fractions depends on how many rows they have. We noticed for our prime numbers, not a lot of options. Here's one seventh, here's one third. This is the sixth and I just stack them. So this was one half because it took two. This is one third, the red one, and this is one sixth. So you could challenge students to take all the other rods, all the ones that aren't up here right now, the orange, the green, the black, and the light green, Find all the other ones that we didn't use and see, are they prime? Are they composite? Can they show you what the unit fraction looks like? It's so important that they understand that unit fractions are not just a number on a board of one over something. Make the unit fraction, make it visible to them. So the same thing holds true for when we said build a color that's the same on top of your pattern block. So here I see I need two reds, here I see I need three blues, here I need six greens. I don't really care what the value of those are. All I need is to, how many do I need to cover the whole. The whole was a yellow hexagon. So again, if I remove pieces, then I can show them another unit fraction representation. This would be one sixth. Here's the whole. Here's one third, same whole. Here's one half, same whole. And in your outcome, students are asked to find equivalent fractions of, or sorry, yes, equivalent fractions of the same whole. So they need to be able to find different representations. So if I understand that in, in just a bit, I will know that two of these fit on top of a blue. So I have one sixth here. I have two sixths over here. So two greens is the same as one blue. One blue is one third two greens would make this two six. So now I can start to talk about equivalent fractions. Here, when I put the greens on here, three triangles will fit on here. 
So three six is the same as one half, which it is. So they start to get the visual of the unit fraction, how the unit fraction helps us to understand where we would put things. And then don't stay limited to just those one shape that you have there. What would change if I called this the whole? Well, now the green is not one sixth anymore. Now it's gonna be one twelfth, it's gonna take 12 of them. The blue isn't one third, it's one sixth and so on. What if I made this the whole? What if I made this the whole? So making the whole different will still mainly use the same um, pattern blocks. Different amounts will give me different unit fractions. So this is the, key, the kind of piece that we want students to be able to see. So if I go back to our example of the money, the dimes, each dime was one tenth of the whole amount. Each one of these dimes is one tenth. Each one of these dimes could be arrived at by jumping exactly the distance of one tenth or one dime. Here's another dime, here's another dime. The distance has never changed. So I'm jumping or marking by one tenth every time. And some students will write it as two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, and others the fourth dime. Some students will say this is my second one tenth. And we'll review some of those in a bit. So this is again important for them to be able to put those fractions onto a number line. Here's an example of the quarter. The quarter says I have one quarter at 25 cents. I would have the second quarter at 50 cents, the third quarter at 75, and the fourth quarter at a dollar. Now in grade four, they don't do improper fractions, but they do do fractions to the hundreds, which means that I can go over that, not necessarily as a fraction, but I should be able to put the number two decimal three five or two decimal one zero two dollars and ten cents onto a number line and if you heard what i just said two dollars and ten cents is easier for them to understand initially than it is for us to put it into just put two decimal one on a number line some students will go i don't know where that goes i don't have no idea is like like 21 is that two and and 11 like they don't know but when you add it to money or change it to money, that gives context to it. So again, here's an example. And we did this one in the other session, so I won't spend time on it. Of We did pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. For equivalent fractions in grade four, the power of doing that work is I could say, is 50 cents 50 cents? Does it matter? 50 cents is the same amount regardless of what coin I use? Yep, correct. 50 cents is 50 cents. All right, but then what do I notice about the fractions that are happening at 50 cents? They don't look the same. So students aren't, and we haven't talked about equivalent fractions yet, we may just ask them to look at those numbers. And what most students have said when they haven't understood equivalent fractions yet, they'll say, oh, all of these have the top number is half of the bottom number. They see a pattern. But if you say to them why, some have an explanation. Some of them will say, I don't know. But if I move it to the end and I see all of them the same number on top as I do on the bottom, the numerator is the same as the denominator, they realize that they're at $1 or 100 cents. Some of them will go back and say, oh, that makes sense then because we were at 50 cents. We were only halfway there. So they're starting to make the connections. But we can use this as a tool to say, well, if this is half a dollar right here, how does five dimes out of a, a 10 equal to half? So we can have that conversation again, right? So it starts to put it in context. This is something that they should be able to do right now. There's a link to the sheet if you wanna get a copy of it, but we might do the first one together. If this is zero and this is one, I went one out of two hops, two out of two hops. So this is one over two, this is two over two. Now students, you fill in the rest. So they should be able to count and find out what the unit fraction is and count by that unit fraction if these are all zero on the left and all one on the right. So it might look like this when they're done. Notice that they did not go over one because we're not gonna get them to do improper fractions, although I am gonna show you a picture of one in just a second. But now we could say to them, can you find something that is equivalent to one half? What other fractions were exactly halfway on the line. Well, they can run it down, take a ruler again and run it down, and they're starting to see those connections. 
So we can start to make it very visual for them and also show them that fractions can be counted on a number line just like any old number would be. They're a number. They are a number, so they belong on a number line. How do we transfer this understanding to strips? When we get into adding and subtracting of fractions, we want students to be able to find those based on strips like this, not on showing them how to multiply the two numbers together in the denominator. That should come out of the work that we do here. So here, if I gave you this and I gave you a link to photocopy this page, I would do it on two sides. One, I would give the students and ask them, can you write what each of these are as unit fractions? In other words, here's my first hop out of two, my second hop. So this is one half, this is one over two. What is this one? I have one, two, three. So this is one third, one third, one third. So each one of these has a unit fraction value. So as I go through and I label them, then I can even ask them, what is equivalent? What's an equivalent value for one half? Well, when I go down, I find that an equivalent was two out of the four pieces that are here, or three out of the six pieces that are here. So wherever these vertical lines line up, I will find an equivalent fraction. They should be able to zoom around here. You give me any fraction, and they can find up and down equivalent fractions just by following that vertical line along. And they could use a ruler, sheet of paper, anything that's folded. On this side here, I have um, some materials for you that are just, they come from the UK. They are shared uh, with, with rights to us um, that you have access to a teacher's guide here, which unpacks unit fractions a little bit more. You don't have to use everything there. In fact, you might not want to use any of it, but I'm providing it to you just because it's done exceptionally well, laid out very easily to go and grab information from. And there is a matching PowerPoint that goes along with it. So there may be a few slides there that may be helpful to you. So again, I just point that out to you and you can have access to that when you go through and have a look at it. As we keep moving on, let's look at some other things that we have available to us. And I wouldn't start with this particular one. Uh, I would bring this in at the end when students are versed in finding unit fractions already and finding equivalent fractions, then we might wanna show them that our old fashioned multiplication table that we might use if we don't know our math facts also helps us with equivalent fractions. So for example, here I see one, this is my ones row, my twos row. But if I look at this as a unit fraction of one half, here is its equivalent fraction. When I multiply by two, I get two fourths. When I multiply by three, I get three six. When I multiply by four, I get four eighths. So I can use this to also identify equivalent fractions or be given an equivalent fraction of 9 18 and find other equivalent fractions or the unit fraction if there's one that exists that fits with that. So it'll work as you move your way down. If I gave you 2 thirds and I said, what's an equivalent fraction for 2 thirds? If I multiply numerator and denominator by 2, I get 4 6. By 3, I get 6 ninths, and so on. So you get the idea. This first, this first column that we have here are all of your unit fractions. So I have one half, these are the equivalent fractions. I have one third is the same as two six, is the same as three ninths and so on. I have one quarter is the same as two eighths and so on. So this column, I can create common unit fractions and they really only have to know, they should know up to one twelfth but they should be versed in one tenths. Like they should be able to move back and forth with those with no problem. So knowing this then helps me to take a unit fraction and find it on a number line. So for example, if somebody said five elevenths, well, five elevenths means I took one eleventh and counted it five times and stopped on the number line. And that would give me five elevenths. So students can leverage their understanding of unit fractions to find any fraction on a number line. Then I can ask them to do things like, if you had three elevenths, which would be three one elevenths hops versus three one quarter hops, if they're all from the same zero, same holes to one, then they should be able to make a comparison. A lot of students, once they understand unit fractions, will even reason out 
this is going to be a pretty small jump compared to this jump because there's so many of them. So this will be smaller than this one. So it's a great way for them to understand how they're going to compare all of their fractions. So here I see the holes coming up. So if I go back to my quarters, remember we said we're not doing improper fractions. However, if I were just to keep counting and say that I have a whole one here, now I'm going to start with another one quarter, another one quarter, another one quarter. It's like adding another quarter into this. So although we're not talking in proper fractions, if I had five quarters in my hand, how much money do I have? I have a dollar and 25 cents. Now the quarter helps me to leverage how I put a decimal number on there as well. Or here's 25 cents, here's 50 cents, here's 75 cents, here's 100 cents or one decimal zero zero. So the quarter really gives us a lot of advantages too to be able to see because the name of it also helps with the position of it. So money is real. And I know I've been harping on that all year, but money ties into so many things that we do. And not only that, it's real that students have it tangibly in front of them. Even if they don't have money in their pocket, we can give them fake money. We can put them onto a money program where they see money and they understand the value of the money, they see the place value of where it fits, they can see how it might fit together when I add things together in place value. So there's all kinds of different ways that I can leverage the understanding of money. So we just saw with unit fractions in particular. How can that help us make connections then for fractions, decimals, and percents, which is your 5.2 that you'll be working on? So again, I'm going to look at, um, oh, I'm going to leave that one for just a second. I want to leverage the money uh, in looking at how I might add and subtract decimal numbers together. And then once I understand how to add and subtract those decimals, I also want to leverage where that fits onto a number line. So again, your four and two, that was the adding and subtracting numbers. But now remember, we kind of left out decimals until just after Christmas or into January, February, depending on where you're at. If they're ready for decimal numbers, then we're adding those into the mix as well. So having this in dollars and cents, we've got $1,000 bills that we can use. You're going up to 10,000. So if we combine that with a money app, you've got everything that you need to build the perfect addition questions for students up to 10,000, which includes decimals. And if the decimals are just talked about in dollars and cents, because you're doing tenths and hundreds in grade four, dollars and cents, that's what they are, dollars and cents. So just do that first, and then we can unpack that cents are, and that the dimes are, and we can equivalent, create the equivalent decimals for those as we move forward. So one of the things that we did practice just briefly in the last session, but I bring it back now because you're talking about cents in terms of dimes and pennies, not in terms of tenths and hundreds quite yet, just get them really versed in adding dimes and pennies. Every 10 pennies, I trade for dime. Every 10 dimes, I can trade for loony. Like, just give them lots of hands-on learning and fun. The kids love the money, but this is a great way for them to practice their regrouping. Also, for them to tell us that they understand that this side of the money strip is building part of a whole. I haven't got the whole dollar yet. But when I get enough to build a whole dollar, I get to trade it and I'm over on the dollar side. So we haven't actually used a decimal here. We just used a line to separate dollars and cents so we could talk dollars and cents. We can bring that decimal in later. It doesn't have to be right now. We just need them to practice. So when I talk about practice, I would have the students put their strip down. I would say, show me something. We'd be working on the base 10 kits of money. Remember, that doesn't include nickels and quarters. It's just base 10, pennies, dimes, loonies, $10 bills, $100 bills, $1,000 bills. So using that instead of base 10 blocks to start with so that they understand what the base 10 system is. Perfect, perfect when we have it for, for dimes and, and pennies. I'd start with dollars first if they haven't done any work. So show me $23 so they could do that. Some students will show you 23 loonies and they'll run out of loonies. So then you can say, well, could you be, could you show me another way of doing that? So they only have tens and loonies to use. So they're gonna have to come up with two tens and loonies. Eventually we want them to be efficient. So use the least number of bills and coins that you possibly can. 
Below that, we can ask them to show us $16. So they can show us $16. Now, instead of writing a column on a page where it writes ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, which doesn't mean anything to a student who didn't understand the math to begin with, now I see that $10 bills are purple in color. I see loonies look like this. Loonies happen to be $1 coins. These happen to be $10 bills. So when I add these together, I'm adding loonies with loonies and dimes with dimes. And then I can create my total of my $39. Let's try another one where they show us $28. And in this case, I'm asking them to show me 16. You know where we're going here. We wanna do lots of practice with no regrouping first get them super fast at it, get them to do some hundreds where there's no regrouping, and they have two different three-digit numbers they're adding together. Just they love the speed at which they can do this, but then we want them to do some regrouping. And again, they're gonna get the right answer if they just count up the money. And for the first time through, if I don't see regrouping, I will say, perfect, excellent, you got $44. Right answer? Now I'm gonna to say to them, but you know what? If I had to grab this and put it in my pocket, that's pretty bulky. Is there a way that you could change that so I wouldn't have so many coins in my pocket? So yeah, okay, I can trade some of those doonies for a $10 bill. And that's the point at which I say from here on in, if I come around and say, you have the right answer, but you're not quite finished. It means that you added everything correctly, but you haven't really regrouped. So I want you to reduce it and be efficient to the least number of coins and bills possible. Lots and lots of practice. And when they are so good and fast at doing the dollars, then introduce, show me $124.13 and have them add another number with cents underneath and cents with cents and no regrouping to start with. And then regrouping of pennies into dimes and then regrouping some dimes into dollars, and then regrouping pennies and dimes and into dollars. Like just make it sequential so that they're starting to get the idea of how those all fit together. So having said all that, we've been calling these out. We're not writing these numbers on the board. We're calling them out. So that's part of their outcomes as well to write a number in oral from oral. So I might say to them, do you see this when you go to the store? And most students will say, no, you don't. And I say, well, what do you see when you go to the store? And I'll say, well, you see that it's 17 and there'll be a point and then the numbers behind it. And I say, well, what's that point called? Some students know it, most don't. They'll say it's just a, it's a point called a decimal. And so what is the point of that decimal? Like, why do we have it? And so when they understand this, they've been doing the work with you, they'll say it separates the cents from the dollars. This is the part we haven't filled a dollar yet. So how do I get them then from just doing dimes and pennies to actually changing it to a decimal? You could just tell them, you could just tell them that a dime is decimal one, or we could have them get some strategy to figure that out on their own. They are not yet learned until grade six, how to take the numerator of a, denom of a fraction and divide by the denominator to change it to a fraction. So we have to find a great way for them to change this to a decimal that makes sense. So one of the easiest ways is to say, when you have one dime, where would that go? Right here, one dime. So if I have one dime, how many pennies did you have with that? No pennies, it was just one dime. So if I had two dimes, it would be two here. How many pennies? No pennies. So you're getting the idea that they're seeing that one dime behind the decimal is the same as a decimal one that two dimes is the same as a decimal two. So for each dime, I increment by decimal one. That's a first starting point, right? So I can start with that, but then I can do the same thing for the pennies. Where do the pennies go? They go here. If I have one penny, I put it here. Great, how many dimes did you have? None. So I see zero dimes and one penny. So now one penny is the same as a decimal zero one. Yes, you could just tell them but do they understand or do they have a strategy to figure that out? And do they understand where that's coming from and could explain it to somebody else? So that's one way that we can leverage that understanding. So lots and lots and lots of practice with that will become important. So now I have a fraction of one tenth that has been changed to a decimal of decimal one or one hundredth, which is 0.01. These Links that you have here are a card game. They're like a memory game. So when you click on the tenths, you will get fractions of one tenth. When you get hundreds, you get fractions of in, in one hundredth. 
And eventually, as you work your way through, this turns out to be a turn the cards down, find the matching pair. So one tenth with point one with a dime is a picture of the bunny, right? So the, all the equivalent ways of showing the fraction, the decimal, the percent will be there. Um, the hundreds and the percentages will be shaded in by the uh, by how many pennies they have or or into a square of 100 squares. So we now start to make connections for students. These are typical kinds of questions that we see in, in sheets that we give students and they get lost. If they don't understand this, they, they're not making the connection. But if you had put a dollar sign in front of this and they've been working with money, you'll be shocked to see how quickly they figure it out. So if this is $1,000, halfway is $500. Half of that is $250. Just talking money makes all the difference in the world for the kids. So if I make it 100, half is 50. If I make it 10, half is five. If I make it one, half is 50 cents. How did we write 50 cents? So again, the students have a way of connecting 50 cents. Here's my quarters. So it starts to make more sense to them. So maybe going to the money first, and then you can drop the signs later. They should be able to do numbers without that eventually. But here's another one where I can say, can you put these on in, in onto the number line? So what if this was $1,000 and $1,000 was divided into five equal pieces? How much would be in each one? 100 was divided into equal pieces. Which bill would you count by five times to get to 100? Which, which coin would you use five times to get to 10? And so on. Just context makes all the difference in the world. So eventually I can say, this is my 100 pennies. If I have 100 pennies, I've got 100%, I've got 100 of them, I get to trade for a loonie. So I could say that the word per cent, per means for each 100 cent in French. So for each 100, this is 100% if I fill the whole thing up. I could say that if I had 44 cents, that would be the same as 44 pennies out of 100 or as a percentage out of 144%. So again, we're just leveraging the understanding of money to connect it for them. I cannot tell you how many times students will go back to money. Even when you bring out the base 10 blocks, they'll change the rise to a $10 bill because that makes sense to them. So now I've got percentages, fractions, decimals. I could change this. I could even put another one down here which says cents if I wanted to. So here's my 10 cents, my dime, my 10 out of 100, my 10% that I would fill out of 10 cents out of 100. So again, it allows them to make those connections that we're looking for. It allows them to find the equivalence of them as well, which is the equivalent form. So now I could ask them to fill some of these in if I wanted to. You could give them mix and match. That slide deck of the cards that I showed you, that's exactly what this will do. It will show them a graph. It'll have a point on the graph. It'll give them a decimal, it'll give them a shaded in. It'll give them a percentage. It's a fun way for them to just increase what they can do in their memory game. So you have access to those and you can download them and, and put them up. Okay, moving ahead. Let's talk a little bit about that word algorithm because that's showing up in all of your ends, your, your um, your number outcomes. And it's come to the forefront again um, because, and I did this deliberately, what is an algorithm? First of all, what is an algorithm? So when we look it up, this is from Alberta Ed's own uh, definition. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure used to solve a problem. Okay, there's a different, there are different variations for recording the steps for each operation for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. There are variations. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because a lot of people are looking at the number and they're saying standard algorithm. Oh, it's just the, it's the, it's the algorithm. And so the question is, what is the algorithm? There is no one algorithm. Now I know that there's the traditional algorithm. So if I were to say multiply 123 by four, most of you, because you were taught to go 123 and then times put four underneath, do the, draw the line underneath and go ahead and multiply, go across, carry and all those things. That's the traditional method, but it's not the 
method. That doesn't work for every child. And if you look in your curriculum documents, it doesn't say algorithm. There is an S at the end. So if that doesn't work, if the traditional method doesn't work for the student, we need to find one that does work for them. And so one of the conversations that's come up on a few occasions is what other algorithms, standard algorithms are there that I could show students? You don't have to teach them all of them. You just need to find one that resonates with the child who's lost and doesn't get it. So without going through them all again, we did start on this in one of our other sessions. These two are linked to resources that will step-by-step -step show you different possibilities for addition, different possibilities for multiplication. There's one in there for, for division. And also for the students who never learned their math facts, the box method is one of the easiest ones for them to see. Lots of adults use the box method and they know their math facts just because it's sequential for them. They like it, they like the way it's laid out. If you don't know what the box method or the rectangular method is, check it out in here. So again, these are other standard algorithms that you have access to that you could show the students. Okay, so we were also going to be working on time. And in grade four, the time measurement talks about seconds. It talks about um, days of the week. It also talks about how we break things down into components of what's the unit fraction for an hour. Right? If I don't know what a unit fraction is, I have no idea what you're asking me. So what does the one minute in the hour, how will I write that? And so again, their understanding of unit fraction comes right back into play again. How do I write a day as a unit fraction of a week? How do I write a day as a unit fraction of a particular month? How do I write a day as a unit fraction of a year, etc.? So they see that the unit fraction can vary depending on what the unit is that we need them to understand. So they're doing quite a bit of work with seconds, minutes, hours. They should be able to figure out if I if I left for school at eight and I arrived at 825, I should be able to tell you how many minutes have gone by. I should be able to tell you that if I got to class and it started at 845 and I was at school for three hours before I got a break, what time was my break at? Like those are the kinds of questions that they should be able to do. But in addition to that, we should be able to also leverage a clock because remember in grade three, they learned analog clocks. So they would need to probably have some review in that because not all of our children know how to tell time um, and they use their phones or whatever, but, but they, they don't, they need to use that clock as well, not just for time, but we're going to leverage that for your unit that you have to teach them in measuring angles. So we could do time and angles at exactly the same time. Those fit so well together that, you know, we could be doing number, we could be doing our work in unit fractions. We could take a break on a Tuesday and say, today we're going to work on measurement and angles. I don't have to finish all of the other stuff. I can take a break. Let's go into measurement and angles. Let's do a little work in there. And then we can come back on Wednesday, do our number work and whatever. And then maybe Thursday we do some more. So we can alternate this. Kids can handle that. There's not a problem with it. But we need to give them those opportunities. So in here, this comes from Marion Small. Uh, and she's got some great ideas in here about just talking about what hours are. So when we talk about a minute being equal to, there is my unit fraction, right? I need to understand that. So again, to help students establish a personal referent for an hour, we need to give them something that they can use that is something they can react to or, or relate to that's an hour long. Do they even know how long a minute is? Most kids don't. Most parents say, just a minute, right? But it's not a minute. Like we don't go a whole minute. We might go 30 seconds. We might go 15 seconds. Okay, what did you need? So it's a saying that we use a lot, just a minute or um, in a minute. I'll be there in just a minute. Sometimes that's five minutes wrong. So do they really know what a minute is? So maybe a moment of silence as we do that on Remembrance Day, have one moment of silence in the class that starts exactly for one minute so that students get a sense of how long exactly one minute is. Or put up a clock that has a second hand on it and let them watch that that 
you know, no talking. Everybody just watches the second hand as it goes around for one complete cycle. So they again, they see that it's one minute. That's an important piece for students to have. So they have a, a, a reference point for what is a minute, what is an hour, what's 10 minutes, what's five minutes, what's a, a task that would take five minutes. Can they come up with examples? What's a task that would take 10 minutes? What's a task that would we would definitely probably need an hour for, et cetera. Okay, so that they get a sense of what those reference might be for them. So again, when I said we could talk about time and angles at the same time, I have in here that we have to work on measuring angles. So first of all, we need to tell them what an angle is. And it's not that they haven't seen an angle before, but they haven't really done a lot of work with it in the new curriculum. So first of all, we need to understand what angles are. We also have to understand where did this whole idea of a degree even come from? Like, what does that mean? And then in grade four, they're really just working on a right angle as a referent. They're not launching necessarily into a protractor right off the bat. But we need to use the protractor to help guide them into what this looks like. So I've included a link in here for you. And the purpose of this link was twofold. One, it was to give you uh, just a, another slide deck. Of, uh, just take me down the, down the lane that says, what exactly is an angle? Like, I, I don't know what that is, so I'm not sure what it is you want me to do. And so you could cut out, there's a link here to cut out two circles per child. We're going to use that as their measuring tool, because remember, they're just supposed to use a right angle as a referent. Doesn't have to be complicated. And for kids who struggle in math, this is really easy for them. Um, but also, what is a degree? We talk about degrees. We say that a circle has 360 degrees, which doesn't mean a whole lot to all students. But really, how big is a degree? So when I say a stu to a student, a, a circle is 360 degrees. I should be really trying to show them, first of all, what a degree is, how big it is. So in, oh, uh, you know what? We won't be able to, oh, we should be able to. Here we are. I'll do it here. So I'm going to grab this and I'll talk about the tool that it's on in just a minute. But I'm going to say to them, I want you to tell me to stop when it comes to one. So now they're part of the team and they're going to help me out with this. We're going to drag this down until they can see a one. And we can say this little distance between our horizontal line and here, that's how big one degree is. And it would take 360 of these guys stacked on top of one another to get a circle. But then, wow, I don't have a whole circle here. This is, this is just half a circle. I see that it's 180 degrees. So typically, all of our protractors that we have for students are going to be these protractors. And Really, that's all I need if I know how to work the protractor. I don't need a whole lot more. But it's important for them to sometimes see that there are protractors that exist that are the complete one three, the 360 degrees. So I've just included a, a sample in here for you so that you can show that to them. Or if you have one in the classroom, that's even better. But we can show them that here, remember we just saw one and it was only halfway. It would be like going on that straight line. Started at zero right here. It went all the way around, and here was the halfway, here's the 180. But if I had the rest of it turned it upside down, I would see that I get all the way around, all the way to 350, and 10 more will take me to 360. So it just gives them another visual so they can see how that works. Some students love those 360 protractors to work with, and others don't. So in this case, we're going to use those paper circles. And those paper circles, we're going to fold them in half, one of them in half so that they see the resemblance of the half circle. They have a circle in their hand, they fold it in half to the protractor. So now they see that it's half a circle, half of 360 is 180. And half of 180, if I fold this one more time, take another one, take the second one, fold it in half, fold it again, I get this perfect fourth of a circle. Now you could do something here. You could just quickly revisit. How many of these would it take to make a circle? Four of them. So what does this represent? The unit fraction of one quarter. How many of these would it take to make a circle? Two of them. What is the unit fraction? One half. So we're just 
revisiting the same thing that we've been doing. And what they're going to do is take this little guy right here, and they're going to run around the classroom and find examples of things that are right angles, things that have a right angle in a book, a corner in the classroom, depending on how square the walls are. And then once they're good at finding those simple ones in the classroom, then we can say, can you find one that's bigger than 90? So in other words, it has a bit of an angle that's much larger than where my corner is. They don't have to know how big it is. They just need to know that it is larger. Or can they find something that's smaller? Could they take the cover of a book and make it less than 90 degrees? So just bring it down. So all of those activities, that's your measuring in non-standard units. So I don't need them to have a protractor in hand. I could take my clock now with my little protractor in hand and say when it's three o'clock, what type of angle is being modeled. So in this case, three o'clock will be a right angle. What other times could model the same angle? I'm not telling them what the angle is. They have to tell me and then they have to find more. So we could do it at nine o'clock. We could do um, the uh, the change, let's say, uh, that that is a half hour on something else. Like if we go nine, well, I guess that's not right angle. Um, what other ones could I have? So I could have nine o'clock, could I give three o'clock? And then what are the ways that I can make the quarters down here? Like how would that work? How would I get to see those pieces? What would this one reflect or half a circle? So again, it gives me a chance to see. And now I can take my clock, change the arms and say, is this more than 90 degrees? Is this less than 90 degrees? Prove it to me. So they could take a picture like this on paper, black and white. They could put their right angle on here and they could prove that there's an extra space that's needed to go and so on. So that's your measurement unit, which could really be done well with time and it gives them practice at telling time, especially if they probably didn't do a lot of that in grade three. So we wanna give them those opportunities. So in here, this is what you have. You've got your slide deck, you've got your foldable, you've got, this one is clocks. So if you need some vis visible clocks, you can put up on the whiteboards. Some of these are still hands where you can navigate the hands. Some of these are actual time. So again, it's, it depends on what you want to use. And then I've included some lessons that you might want to do. Just scroll down to the additional lesson section and you'll find that there's some there that you can use. So hopefully there's some pieces in there that would be helpful. Okay, other pieces with our referent angle. Um, again, when we talk about students analyze and explain geometric properties, geometric properties are measurable. The geometric properties define a hierarchy. So again, properties are measurable. I can find that a square has right angles in it. I can use my measurable tool. Rectangles have right angles in them. Parallelograms is also a rectangle is also a parallelogram, but not all parallelograms have right angles in them and so on. So I can see how I might be able to leverage these. And then I go through and I look at the different angles and sides that I see in the different types of triangles. So here I'm identifying the triangle based on the lengths of their sides. Here, I'm naming the angles. So when it's a right angle, that's my tool that I'm using to measure. When it's bigger than my right angle, it's obtuse. And when it's smaller than my right angle, it's acute. So now I can identify angles based on their names as well. When the book cover is only at a slight angle, then I'm making an acute angle. So that's the kind of language that they should get really good at. And the more you let them walk around and find examples of their own, that's that's great. The hierarchy, the idea of what a hierarchy, geometric properties define a hierarchy for classifying. So let's have a look at a hierarchy of quadrilaterals and triangles. So here I start with polygons. I could have three-sided ones. Those are called triangles. I could have quadrilaterals, four-sided ones, and then anything that's five plus. So in the triangles, we just talked about I could have the sides equilateral, isosceles, and scalene. So same, two sides the same, no sides the same. And then I can I, I can identify them based on their angles. In an equilateral, they're all the same and they're all acute. In an isosceles, they could be acute, obtuse, right, depending on what kind of triangle it is uh, and how we draw it, sorry. And a scalene, again, I can have three different sized angles on it. And because there's three different side tri or three different side lengths, I will have three different angles. 
here because it's isosceles means two sides the same two of the angles will be the same and one will be different whether they're acute or obtuse that remains to be seen depending on the triangle that we have so again when i have trapezoid same idea i can have four-sided figures in which basically no sides are parallel they're just looks like a kite i can have where one side is parallel group of uh, sides are parallel I can have where two sides are parallel. And what are the things that fall into that? And a square, remember, falls into here as well. So that's what a hierarchy is. It's just a way of breaking down the different pieces that we have and what that looks like. Your other piece in geometry that we're working on, and that's more of the February, March, is students analyze and explain geometric properties that we can find in nature. So what are some things that we can see that look like uh, properties of polygons? They're not perfect, they're close to. And that's what your understanding says. A shape resembling a polygon does not share the defining geometric properties. In other words, it may not be a perfect right angle or it looks like it's a rectangle close to, but not quite. So we say that they're a close approximation. And we use that description for things that we find in nature. There are so many different places that you can find polygons in nature. So here I see the hexagon. It's at the end of a pencil. That's a good representation. Here I see that the, the branches on a tree, for whatever reason, look like they were a triangle. They're not a perfect triangle, but they're close to. So we see shapes in nature, and we would encourage students to find shapes in the classroom, to go outside, find shapes in nature, and then whatever other examples they could bring to school. These are three videos where you can have polygons in nature and in the real world, just so that you've got something to show them, so that they've got something to think about. They might have a favorite flower, like where does that go? And so here's your transfer question. Remember, a transfer is like a summative. It's like a mark question. Oops, and I've got a typo there. I'll fix that. What is the relationship between geometric properties of polygons and the real world? So what are the relationships between what I know about a geometric shape of a polygon? It has five sides, it's got five angles the same, and something I see in nature. It looks like it's very similar to a five-sided figure. Or I see a stop sign, right? What's the relationship between a stop sign and a geometric figure that we know? That's the kind of thing that we want them to be able to do. Polygons in nature. All right, they're all gonna wanna start, okay? When students are good at doing equivalent fractions, we might want to do something like um, a domino game. There's lots of these kinds of things you can find online. There's a couple of games that I have. It's called Math Facto. And again, they're using um, equivalent fractions. We wouldn't use the section that has the addition because that comes into grade five for us like denominators but they could definitely use the graphing one and the equivalent fraction one. So the red one is the starting one and then they have to find the matching pair. So lots of there's lots of games out there for fractions that students could use. There's a couple of foldables that we did in the past and, and I didn't attach this one because it doesn't scan well, but nonetheless, this is one in which we take music, a whole note and give them the connection there. A half note, here's your half of the whole. A quarter note is half of or half of the quarter, right? So I go, or half of, sorry, a quarter note is half of a half. And then when I look at this one, I have the one eighth note. So it just, again, brings it back to them so that they see this is not just about math. It shows up in nature. It shows up in lots of other places. Okay, so hopefully that gives you lots of ideas that you might be able to use when you're unpacking this. When we come back in our last session, we will do algebra, and that will let us get into solving equations um, and using the one operation that we're allowed to use that gives us lots of possibilities that we'll be able to do with the students. So in our next session, we'll unpack the algebra pieces. Um, just some links in here that might be helpful to you. The verbs that are in your math, remember, we have to teach the verbs and assess the verbs. So in order to make sure that everybody has kind of a common understanding of what the verbs are, K to three and four to six documents have been prepared for you, which define, they give you an example of each of the verbs that you will find in the curriculum document. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't downloaded these, to download them and just have them available to you. You can share them with the kids, but you can just use them for yourself as well. The CPAR documents, remember, they stand for Curriculum Planning Assessment Resource. 
These are being created for each organizing idea in each grade. So, and, and each outcome. So if your number, for example, in grade four, there are, I think, five numbered outcomes, there will be five CPAR documents in the section called number for grade four. Each of the or, uh, learner outcomes gets its own document. And in those documents, you will find them, um, they count, they basically will, will talk about um, what exemplars. It'll talk to you about what does each of those lines in the cusp mean? It unpacks it gives you illustrative examples. There's sample formatives. There's a sample summative in there. There's resources, there's books, there's kind of hopefully enough place for you to go to if you're short on something that you can find a, a place that you can find any of your resources. Don't forget too that the new Learn Alberta site offers you resources there as well. And if you have already signed into it, then you have access to um, the resources that have been already created for um, by teachers that have been posted there as well. So lots of places that you can go to now and they're starting to really fill up. So you've got lots of choices that you have available. Okay, some teachers have done a fraction board game with me. It's a very simple thing. You don't need me to be there. It's just really taking shapes that you can buy in just plastic bags at Dollar Tree or Dollarama. This is just a foam mat. Um, you create what kind of unit fractions or equivalent fractions you want on just a number cube. You just write them on there and then they play, they, they create their own game board and then they play it with the number of people in the, in the group or in the, in the uh, class. And as they roll, whatever they land, let's say I got one half. If I started at, uh, here's my start, I have to find where the first one half is. I move my marker here. This demonstrates one half doesn't have to be fancy. It's just so they understand what the, the fraction is being represented. And then the first person to the finish is the one who wins the game. Just some ideas that you might want to use. Okay. Um, okay, I think that is all that we have. So I hope that that gives you a good start to the next sections that you're going to be working on and, and moving them through. So um, let me know if you have any questions at all. Talk to your local consortia representative as well and see if there's anything there that you need. So thanks again, and we will see you, I believe it is in early March that we will see you. I'm just going to stop the recording, so if anybody has any questions. Yeah.